Have you, how long has it been since you did something really silly? I, I had a friend that I was speaking with on the phone this week, and she told me a story on herself that I think you'll enjoy. I was telling Bob this last night when him and I were talking. Uh, my, my friend is a computer person. She, in fact, has taught computers. And they recently switched to internet providers and wireless routers, for those of you who know about those kinds of things. And she, she said her son had set up the wireless network while she was gone. And so she started to work on a project and she needed to log on to the internet. And she realized that she had not talked to her son and got the wireless. She didn't know which wireless network was theirs, so she sent her son a text. She said, son, which one of these wireless networks is ours? Because she looked, there were a whole bunch of them there. You know how it is if you set up wireless network. And there were a whole bunch of them that were there. And a few minutes later, she got back this reply. Mom, look at the list. It's the one that says, Mom, this is the one. <laughs> now, what's wrong with that? And I understood completely, because I would have looked at the list, saw that there was a big, long list, and I would have thought, well, I would have no way to know which one it was, so I wouldn't have even read the names. Sometimes we are like that. We are looking at a situation, and we simply fail to miss the most obvious things. But at other times, we are going through a challenging time and we look for God and we can't seem to find Him. Sometimes God speaks so clearly. I've had moments in my life when I needed to hear from Him and, and I did. And then I have had other moments when I needed, I thought I needed to hear from God and it felt like he was silent. Both are part of my experience, and frankly, both are part of the stories. Both of those are in the stories of Scripture. We're finishing up the series on the voice, how to hear God. And this morning, we're going to be looking at probably the most, the classic story of struggle and faith the book of Job, the story of Job. And if you're not familiar with the story, it is absolutely gut-wrenching when you read what happened to Job. One of my favorite authors, Philip Yancey, has written a book called Reaching for the Invisible God. And in it, he makes a statement, and I want to read that statement to you because I think it's, it's quite interesting. It's about how sometimes we do not hear God. Listen, Yancey writes, Faith boils down to a question of trust in a given relationship. Do I have confidence in my loved ones or in God, as the case may be? If I do stand on a bedrock of trust, the worst circumstances will not destroy the relationship. Abraham climbing the hill with his son to Moriah. Job scratching boils under the hot sun. David hiding in a cave, Elijah moping in the desert, Moses pleading for a new job description. All these heroes experienced crisis moments that sorely tempted them to judge God as uncaring, powerless, or even hostile. Confused and in the dark, they faced a turning point, whether to turn away embittered or to step forward in faith. In the end, they all chose the path of trust, and for this reason we remember, we remember them as giants of the faith. Unfortunately, not everyone passes these tests of faith with flying color. The Bible is also littered with the tales of others, Cain, Samson, Solomon, Judas, who flunked. Their lives give off a scent of sadness and remorse of what might have been. One Christian thinker, Soren Kierkegaard, spent a lifetime exploring the test of faith that call into question God's trustworthiness. Again and again, he turned to biblical characters like Job and Abraham, who survived excruciating trials of faith. During their times of testing, it appeared to both Job and Abraham that God was contradicting himself. God surely would not act in such a way, yet clearly he is. Kierkegaard ultimately concluded, and I get his conclusion because this is good. He concluded that the purest faith emerges from just such an ordeal. 
Even though I do not understand, I will trust God regardless. If you have not had it happen at to this point in your life, there will be a moment at some point in your life when you will be struggling and it will seem God is silent. What your faith does at that moment will be really significant. Job chapter 1 is where we'll be starting this morning. It's found on page 390 if you're using one of our pew Bibles. Sometimes even people of great faith struggle to find hope during their darkest hour because God doesn't seem to respond the way we expect Him to. I had a friend several years ago who came to a crisis of faith. She did not feel God was being fair. And she walked away from the faith. And although she is not as hardened as she once was about it, she, has, she still has not returned. She was disappointed with God. I'm going to encourage you with the story of Job to understand that even if we do not understand God, God is still trustworthy. He's always working with a bigger picture than we are. Let's read the story beginning in verse 8. It's a very dramatic story. Follow along as I read it out loud. Then the Lord asked Satan, Have you noticed my servant Job? He's the finest man in all the earth. This is beginning in verse 8. He's the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. Satan replied to the Lord, Yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and take away everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. All right. You may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting at the oldest brother's house, a messenger arrived at Job's home with this news. Your oxen were plowing with the donkeys feeding beside them. When the Sabines raided us, they stole all the animals and killed all the farmhands. I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. The fire of God has fallen from heaven and burned up your sheep and all the shepherds. I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, a third messenger arrived with this news. Three bands of Chaldean raiders have stolen your camels and killed your servants. I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived arrived with this news. Your sons and your daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. Suddenly a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. He said, I came naked from my mother's womb. I will be naked when I leave. The Lord gave what I had and the Lord has taken it away. Praise the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin by blaming God. What a passage. Let's pray and then we'll get into our study. God, we cannot help but feel the horror of an experience like Job had. I pray that you would open our hearts and minds to understand faith when we encounter a moment when faith seems useless. Of trust when trust seems unfounded. I ask God that you would guide each of us in our thinking and in our perception this morning. Amen. If you're going to follow along in your notes, let's start with this first main point. Being godly does not remove problems. I've said this before, but if you listen to preachers on television and the radio, you're frequently going to hear a common theme. That if you follow God, your life will be perfect. It's a lie. Bold-faced lie. There was no one more godly in the Old Testament in the story of Job than Job. No one. In fact, in just a moment, we will actually look at the passage, but it says Job was like no other man in his time frame. And yet, look what happened to Job. 
I want you to know when you follow God, God does not promise that you'll be rich, always healthy, your children will always behave, your job will always be perfect, your spouse will always be wonderful. And everything will just work out precisely the way you want. That is never God's promise. After reading the passage, I can honestly say that I have never encountered anyone in 35 years of being a pastor who encountered as much trial and suffering as Job did. Satan complained that Job was only serving God because God was protecting him. He says, you bless him on every hand. You keep me from hurting him in any way. And it's only because you have given him so much and made him rich that he is actually serving you. But if you will allow me to take away what he has, he will curse you to your face. God said, all right, you may test him. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but you can't touch him. What we read next is painful. But I want you to notice something. God described what was going to happen as a test. See it there in verse 12? All right, you may test him. That was God's perspective. Satan's was far different. Look at this next statement in your notes. God allows hard times to test us, but Satan wants hard times to destroy us. There is a spiritual component in all of our struggles. You and I will from time to time encounter difficulties and challenges. We do, don't we? Isn't that a part of your life? It's certainly a part of mine. And those challenges, those struggles, if you continue in faith through those, your faith will be strengthened. But Satan's goal is completely different. Satan's goal is to destroy you. And if we continue in faith, God gets us through those challenges and our faith not only sustains us, but it grows stronger. God was going to allow Job to go through some incredible struggles, but he knew that Job would ultimately survive and be stronger because of it. That opportunity was there. Now, Satan is going to inflict as much pain as possible. Now, it's not only what happened, but the way it happened. The disaster Satan brought about would be enough to sink anybody. Honestly, I cannot imagine how I would endure that much loss. Really, what happened is, Job lost everything in about 10 minutes' time. Can you imagine someone showing up to you, showing up, coming into the service, coming up to Joe and Joyce and saying, your house caught fire and it burned to the ground. And just as Joe and Joyce are finishing digesting that, someone else comes through the back door and says, oh, and we don't know what happened out in the parking lot, but your car exploded. It's in pieces all over the parking lot. And someone else comes in and says, Joe and Joyce, we don't know how to tell you this, but your two children went to church together this morning and they were involved in an automobile accident on the way and they both died in that crash. And someone else comes in just as that person finishes and says, Joe and Joyce, your grandchildren had decided to go to a picnic today and they got hit by a meteor. They're all dead. Can you imagine how you would deal with that much bad news that fast? I mean, truly, there would be no way to comprehend the grief Job must have felt. Unimaginable, truly. Like I said, in 35 years of being a pastor, I have never seen anyone who endured that much, that fast, that severe. Never. I've been around people who have struggled greatly, but I've never seen someone lose that much. Can you imagine losing everything you love in 10 minutes' time? I cannot. Look at the next statement in your notes. The hard times Job faced were so overwhelming because they came so fast. And here's the reality for us. At times, challenges seem to show up in herds. 
You know, it, it's, it's not too bad. You can kind of handle bad things if they just come once in a while. Okay, Dan and Angela, you guys are going to have five things bad happen this year. Okay? Let's do one next month, one the month after, one the month after, one the month after, and then we'll save the last one until the end of the year. That would be overwhelming to know you had... <laughs> yeah, Dan looks at it and says, we can handle that. <laughs> but if they all show up at once... And frankly, isn't that the way it sometimes works? Have you ever noticed that when the refrigerator goes out, probably something else is going out soon? You have a major repair on the car, and the transmission goes out of the other one. I mean, just crazy stuff. Anybody else had stuff like that happen? Where, I mean, it just comes in packs. When those things happen, it is, in fact, a crisis of faith. Are you going to keep trusting God? Are you going to get through this? You know, you do your best. To, if, if I had the time, I would tell you a hilarious story that happened to me several years ago when I was trying to get my car repaired. It was crazy. It was really fun. It is funny now. It was in no way, shape, or form funny. Then I eventually ended up junking the car. That's how bad it got. And that was after buying three transmissions. It was, it was really a mess. But it was a crisis of faith. It, did, it wasn't just one thing. It was boom, 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 boom. And it is possible to respond in a godly way to challenges like that, but it is not automatic and it is not easy. I am absolutely amazed. It is possible to respond in a godly way, and we know that because of the way Job responded. Look back at the passage. Job... Chapter 1, verse 20, Job stood up, he tore his robe in grief, he shaved his head, he fell to the ground to worship. I'm afraid I would have done those things and I would have fallen to the ground and said, Oh God, have mercy on me. This is so unfair. But that's not what Job does. Here is what Job did. Look at this final statement in this first point. We will not understand everything in our lives, but we can cling to God. This incredibly strong man falls to the ground in anguish, but he calls out to God in worship. He said, I came into the world with nothing. I will leave with nothing. God gave and he has every right to take. Praise the name of the Lord. Not a hint of... Job shaking his fist in God's face and saying, it's just not fair. It would be easier if the story actually ended here, but it actually doesn't. Let's look at a second thing. Not only does being godly not remove problems, but secondly, being godly does not remove questions. How many of you think you would, be, you would have been asking questions, you would be asking questions if that much happened that fast? Absolutely, I don't think you could keep from it. In this part of the message, let me tell you in advance, we're going to move quickly because we're covering 36 chapters. I promise we will be out of here no later than 4 this afternoon. Now, we are going to move very quickly. But because we are covering so many chapters, I'm not really going to be reading them, I'm going to be summarizing them. So understand, I will give you some scriptures which you can jot down in your notes if you want to follow up on them later. But because we're covering the entire book this morning, we're skimming. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, Satan, and you may want to keep your, your Bibles open because if you have them open, we're going to be staying within the book of Job. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, Satan again before, appears before God, and God again points out that Job hasn't sinned this time, Job... This time, Satan says to God, that's true because he's still got his health. You take away his health and he will curse you to your, faith, to your face. And God says, okay, but you can't take his life. What happened next is almost too difficult to imagine. In verse 7, Satan struck Job with boils. Let me ask, anybody here ever had a boil? Notice where the boils were. Head 
the toe. I've only had one or two boils in my life, but I can tell you they are really painful. And the only way to sort of semi-stay comfortable is you don't put any pressure on the boil. Make sense to everybody? But if you're covered with boils from head to toe, there is no way not to be putting pressure on a boil. So he was in incredible pain. And in fact, if you look closely at the passage, it says they were horrible boils, or different translations, terrible boils. The word in the Hebrew literally is evil. These were bad. Some medical people who, who have studied Job say this seems to describe the disease elephantiasis. Elephantiasis is when, you're in t is when your body or parts of your body swells up enormous. We really don't know if there were typical boils that we think of when we hear the word boils or if it was something like elephantiasis where my leg would swell to this size. But he was in constant pain and it said he sat in the sun scratching his boils as they began to heal because they itched so badly with broken pieces of pottery. It's not only interesting what Satan destroys in his attack, but it's also interesting what he did not. The only words in the entire book of Job that we hear from Job's wife are found in chapter 2, verse 9. And here is the advice she gave him. Are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die. Wonder why Satan didn't remove her. Now, to be completely fair, she had lost everything too. She had gone from, and I didn't talk about this earlier, but Job was one of the richest men in the region. And she had gone from being the wife of the richest man in the region to being dirt poor and having a husband who was too sick to carry on much of a conversation. And not only did Satan not remove Job's wife, but he also did not remove some of Job's friends. And they show up to encourage Job. Let me be really clear. When we are really hurting and we are really down, we need self-righteous, self -righteous, condescending jerk friends like this about as much as we need an atomic bomb. These three guys show up to comfort Job and they do nothing to help. Now, some of the things they said were true. But can I give you some advice? When you are dealing with someone who is dealing with incredible loss, don't show up with lots of answers. Show up and be a friend. That's what Job needed. He couldn't make sense of it all, and their answers, frankly, did not help. They only made matters worse. They were not helpful. But there was something else that happened which is interesting, and this is not attributed to Satan. This is one of the things which makes the book of Job so incredibly interesting. Look at the next statement in your notes. One of the most difficult things to understand in the book of Job is that until Job 38, that's chapter 38, the main character Job never hears a single word from God. He heard nothing. He was crying out to God. If you read these chapters we're talking about, he calls out to God for help. And God seems to be deaf. He hears nothing. Is God there? Yes, he is. We will know that because of what happens with, first, with chapter 38 to the end of the book. But he hears nothing from God. But I want, you to hear, I want you to get what I'm preparing to tell you. Just because God does not respond now in a way that you can hear does not mean he is not there. Sometimes we are a lot like my friend with the wireless network. He's there, we're just not perceiving him. He's right in front of us, we just can't see it. I cannot tell you why God does not speak until chapter 38, but he certainly did hear from his three friends Eliaphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. What names? In Job 3, chapter 3, 
Job curses the day he was born. He lashes out at how horrible his life was, how terrible his life is, and how unfair life is, and how unfair his friends are. In various degrees, all three friends will latch on to those words and try to straighten Job out. Over the course of those chapters, chapter 2 to chapter 37, all of them in some way, shape, or form will say to Job, this terrible thing that has happened to you could not have happened if you had not done something really, really bad. Had Job done anything wrong? No. He was not guilty. This was not punishment for sin. This was a test, not a punishment. Now, over the course of these chapters, Job is going to say some really off-the-wall things as he struggles to make sense of what was going on. But instead of showing him grace, these three friends piled on and shoved him down even further. I think it's significant that even though Job said some harsh things to God, he didn't quit talking to God. He kept talking to God. He refused to give up. In fact, in chapter 13, after all three of Job's so-called friends have turned, had a turn trying to correct him, Job begins to argue his case before God. He didn't... He had done nothing. There was no big sin in his life that would justify what was going on. I shared a quote earlier from Philip Yancey. Allow me to share another one. Look at, what, look at this. And this is a, in your notes. Job's friend reacted to his doubts with shock and dismay. Stop feeling that way. Shame on you for having such scandalous thoughts, they said in effect. God, who had his own differences with Job, nevertheless held up Job, not his friends, as the hero. At the end of the book, these three friends who showed up sometimes with technically correct answers didn't impress God. It wasn't that Job's friends were completely wrong, but they were very wrong in their condescension and self-righteousness. Instead of allowing him time to come to terms with what, were ha what was happening, they were self-righteous and condescending. In fact, Yancey's right. In spite of the fact that Job messed up and said some pretty awful things during this time, Job was the one who was more spiritual than those who were giving spiritual-sounding platitudes to him. This back and forth between Job and his friends goes on and on for chapter after chapter. Much of it sounds good, but to be brutally honest, it was not. In chapter 27, Job finally gives his final speech to his friends. It was his tenth speech trying to defend himself. It continued all the way through chapter 31. Job didn't handle everything right, but God was willing to restore him. And here's something I want you to understand. When you call out to God from the midst of a horrible situation, God is there whether you immediately hear him or not. Look at this next statement in your notes. Job dis demonstrates that believers may be depressed, frustrated, angry, and overwhelmed, and yet in their struggle can still please God. Job did not do everything right, but Job continued clinging to God desperately. In the next section, we're going to see that Job was off track enough that God will confront him, but he's still the hero of the book. Job's still the one who's recognized at the end of the book as being stronger than he was at the beginning. And I want to be really clear. If you are off track and you, you have made some really dumb mistakes, you are not alone. And God has not given up on you. Mark it down. That's exactly what happens with Job. And God does not give up. Final point of the message, point number three. Trust God. He will eventually speak. As I said earlier, Job, God remains silent until chapter 38. He loved Job, no question about that. He'll demonstrate that he's committed to Job, but he also put Job in a... He allowed Job to be in a tough place. Although Job had fought against being disrespectful, he stepped over the line and actually was. It's hard not to, it's hard not to understand Job because he had to be incredibly frustrated. God, in essence, says to Job, Okay, you have asked me some questions, now I will ask you some. Where were you when I created the world? Did you measure out the earth's boundaries? In verse, chapter 40, verse 2, God asked the now silent Job, Do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You're God's critic, but do you have answers? 
Here's the point we can learn from Job's frustration with God and God's answers to Job. Look in your notes. God understands our struggles, but in the midst of our pain, we must not forget that God is God and we are not. Over the years, I have met many people who were mad at God. Frankly, if you are mad at God, God's big enough he can handle it. But keep talking to him. Just as in a marriage, every husband and every wife sometimes gets frustrated with one another. Right? But when you quit talking, the marriage is in deep trouble. As long as you keep talking, as long as you cling to one another and are committed to work through the problems, you probably will pull through. But when you retreat to separate rooms and quit talking and no longer put anything into the relationship, the marriage is in deep trouble. And if you don't change it, the marriage is in a dying spiral that will eventually lead to disaster. Unless you change something. And that's what Job is doing. God confronts him and Job listens. Job got the point after God spoke from chapters 38 to 41, the first six verses of Job 42 show that Job finally realizes he's out of line. It's interesting that although Job had demanded answers from God, and I want you to get this next statement, God did not give him answers. He never said, this is why it happened. In fact, interestingly enough, in the book of Job, the book of Job never gives the answers Job was looking for. God, why did this happen? We're never told. How many of you have had bad things happen in your life? Hands down. How many of you got an explanation from God as to why the bad things had happened? Put your hand up nice and high. Look at all those hands not in the air. There's the point. The point is that even though bad things happen and even though God in his sovereignty has allowed them, you have to trust God because you're not going to understand it all. I do not understand it all. Job did not understand it all. And God's message to Job was basically, trust me. Trust me. Now, did trust make any sense? Actually, the answer is yes. It made perfect sense. But I want you to notice God did not give the answers Job was looking for. Let me do another quote from Philip Yancey. This one's not in your notes, but it's on the screen. God had the perfect opportunity to address the problem of pain in his speech at the end of Job. The longest single speech by God in the Bible. Yet, avoided the topic entirely. You know, wouldn't you like to know why God allows bad things to happen? God says, I'm not going to give you the answer. You're just going to trust, have to trust me anyway. Now, God had the perfect opportunity to answer, but he didn't. There's an interesting statement, though, in Job chapter 40, verse 10. It says that when Job prayed for his friends, God restored his fortune. Now, I want you to get that. Job prayed for who? His friends. These three jerks. Right? Some translations say when he prayed for their forgiveness. We don't know. But he prayed for them. And when Job did that, what did God do? Did you see it there? Chapter 42, verse 10. When Job prayed for his friends, God did what? Restored his fortune. In fact, if you look at it, it gives the details of this many camels, this many sheep, all the details like that, this many children. If you look at the beginning chapter, chapter 1, and you look at the final chapter, chapter 42, you will discover that God gave Job precisely twice as much as he had had of everything, except children. And someone has correctly observed. That's because 20 children would actually not be a blessing. I can't imagine. Can you imagine raising 20 children? <laughs> the point is, 
The point is, Job maintained his faith. God did not give all the answers, but he restored Job. He gave back what Job needed. I do not know what challenges you will face, but I do know that they will sometimes be hard to handle. And I do know that sometimes God will seem to be absent, but he won't be. What we've been looking at is the story of a man who suffered in ways that are beyond imagination. Let me give you one other little detail about Job, which is quite interesting. Many people think that the oldest book in the Bible is the book of Genesis because it's the first book of the Bible. But the, the Old Testament's not in chronological form. The, the books are not written. They're not put in chronologically. That is the oldest book. Actually, most Bible scholars, it's the book of Job. Isn't that interesting? That the oldest book deals with one of the most basic challenges. God, how could you allow something like this to happen? And God says, trust me. Even if you don't hear the answers you're looking for, trust me. God doesn't always give immediate answers. In fact, sometimes he leaves us with more questions. And I came across a, a, a statement by Mark Copenhaver. Look at this on the screen. This is in your notes. In the Gospels, Jesus asked 307 questions. Don't put the answer up yet, by the way. He was asked 183 questions. Anybody want to guess how many direct answers to questions Jesus gave? Okay, now he's asked 307, or he asked 307. He has asked 183 questions. How many direct answers do you think Jesus gave? What'd you say, Angela? Two? More than two. You were close, Angela. Now, isn't that interesting? He gave direct answers to three questions. Let me ask you a question. When somebody gives you an answer and you try to remember the answer so you can repeat it on the test, you really are just regurgitating information, right? How many of you ever remember studying for a test cramming the night before? How many of you have forgotten 90% of what you crammed into your brains? But if you have to process by a series of questions and questions are answered with questions that make you struggle and you learn those lessons in a totally different way. Here's the reality. For every direct answer he gave, Jesus literally asked 100 questions. So I want you to know the next time you ask, you may not get a direct answer. But it doesn't mean God will not be there. God often uses challenging times to teach us lessons that we would never learn any other way. So, the next time that I go through a hard time, you just come around me and expect me to be all smiles and... No, I will be just like you. I will be frustrated. I will feel sorry for myself. I will perhaps be angry. But I hope I will do what Job did. I hope... I will cling to God even when I do not understand. Allow me to conclude with the story of a boy named James. James had big ambitions. He wanted to become the most famous cheese manufacturer in the world. I have never known anybody with that dream, but that was the dream James had. He began making cheese and James bought a little wagon with a horse. His horse's name was Paddy, P-A-D-D-Y. And he went around the streets of Chicago selling cheese. After working long, long hours for several years, James came to the realization that he was not getting ahead. In fact, the longer he worked, the further behind he was getting. James was a Christian and he said, you know, I think I have been going about this all wrong. Maybe I need to turn my business over to God and say, God, I will serve you first and worrying about becoming a famous cheesemaker second. And so he did. He turned the business over to God. He got involved. He became active in church. He began serving God. And his business, in fact, did begin to turn around. In fact, James established a network of food companies. Perhaps you have heard of them before. 
the James Craft Food Company, Philadelphia Cream Cheese, Maxwell House Coffee, Kool-Aid, Kraft Macaroni and Cheese. Who doesn't love an Oreo? And it was only when James Kraft realized that working harder was not getting him ahead and he said, God, I will trust you even with my business that things finally came together. God did not give answers, but he provided solutions. And that is what I believe God does with us. You know, if you are going through one of those times of crisis, I promise you that we will not be like those jerk friends that Job had. We will try to encourage you. Now, we may not have all the answers, and we may not even help in the way you think we should, but we will try to be a gentle, kind friend. But I can promise you God will be there. And if you do not know Him today, I want you to know this is a God you can trust. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your love for us, for the way you have demonstrated to us that you're faithful even when we do not see it temporarily. Thank you, God, that you are our God and that we are your people and that we can trust you even when we do not understand you. In your name we pray these things.